All right, let me get ready now to transition us to our next video tour. Thank you for your patience um, with our sound quality and all of that. We are doing our best to figure this all out as art historians. This is our, our first time running this type of conference. And um, thank you all for inadvertently uh, helping us learn. OK, so the next part of our program is an introduction to Kirkland Museum and our temporary exhibition. Wasn't that an amazing informational talk from Jill, though? Um, we're just so grateful to get a little sneak peek of the dormant before we're able to go. Um, the exhibition, our current exhibition, is titled Truth, Beauty, and Power, Christopher Dresser and the Aesthetic Movement. It's on view in Denver um, until January 2nd. And this exhibition is unlike any we've done before. It's a deep dive into 28 decorative art pieces from the aesthetic movement, which along with arts and crafts is the earliest work in our international decorative art collection assembled by our founding director and curator, Hugh Grant, not the actor. And it is a chance to explore the foundations of our collection. The design reformers that founded the arts and crafts movement and aesthetic movements really set the stage for modernism that you can see throughout the rest of Kirkland Museum's collection, which continues through till um, postmodern design around the year 2000. So though Christopher Dresser did not consider himself an aesthete, we really discovered that his philosophies and revolutionary designs were the best way to share examples of the four central themes in the exhibition, which are Japanism, color, animalia, and art botany. And of course, the stunning five-legged chair, which we will talk about more in greater detail later in the program. So now uh, we are going to, Becca and I are going to take you through a little tour of all of Kirkland Museum and our temporary exhibition. And feel free to ask any questions specific to Kirkland Museum in the Q&A and we will answer them for you. Hello and welcome to Kirkland Museum of Fine and Decorative Art. My name is Maya Wright. I'm the Director of Interpretation, and I will be giving you a little introduction to the museum. Artist Vance Kirkland is the namesake of Kirkland Museum. He lived in Colorado as an educator and painter until his death in 1981. He was a mentor and friend of Hugh Grant, our founding director and curators who inherited his estate and with extensive support from Merle Chambers, philanthropist and vice president of the Kirkland Museum Board, came to the conclusion that he would found a museum to promote Vance Kirkland's work. All of the paintings you've seen so far are Vance Kirkland's in reverse chronological order. And they have expanded the collection to include three principal collections, the estate of Vance Kirkland, the work of other Colorado and regional artists, ceramists, painters and sculptors. This is a stunning Vance Kirkland. And then an international decorative art and design collection, which we show here at Kirkland Museum in Denver. This is our promenade gallery, and off of this gallery, you can enter into six side galleries that allow you to time travel through the collection. This is Arts and Crafts Gallery 3, the first part historically of our time travel experience through Kirkland Museum. We have in this gallery the aesthetic movement and arts and crafts furniture on permanent display, along with realism paintings by Colorado artists. Here, for example, we have some Harvey Ellis furniture. We have 
pottery from the American art potteries, this Frank Lloyd Wright table from Broad Margin in the center, and this rug, and peacock tapestry on the wall there by William Morris, the founder of the arts and crafts movement. We often like to say on tours, William Morris said, if there be a golden rule, let it be this, have nothing in your houses you don't know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. And Vance Kirkland, our namesake, said, if I'm going to sit in something, eat out of something, or drink out of something, it's going to be great design. So while they were from different centuries, that sort of idea of good design has become the center of our decorative art collection. Here we have some of our aesthetic dinnerware that is not part of our temporary exhibition. And we've also left some of the Christopher Dresser pieces like this beautiful piece on the left in this gallery where they are always on view. Here we have some furniture by Bugatti and a beautiful Christopher Dresser screen and the Thebes stool which you've heard about and we'll hear more is here and then we have a shelf of Christopher Dresser metalworks as well and a vase here. So now we'll proceed through this doorway as you enter into the next gallery of this time travel experience, as we like to say, you jump about 25 years in each room. So now we're around 1900 and the heart of the Art Nouveau designs um, primarily in France. Suddenly, we hope that visitors can see a visual distinction even if they don't know anything about these periods. All of the amazing curves, the inspiration of the female body, there are no right angles anywhere. This is a stunning one-of-a-kind bed frame by Louis Majorelle with inlays of orchids. Here we have a Tiffany lamp and a baluster shield from the Paris Metro by Hector Guimard. And these pieces are paired with impressionist paintings by Colorado artists, including these works by John Thompson, one of the first modern painters to move to Denver in 1917. And then this room has two other design styles in it as well that are contemporary with Art Nouveau from other areas of Europe. Here is a corner dedicated to Glasgow style and the work of Charles Rennie Mackintosh and his compatriots. We are lucky to have three Charles Rennie Mackintosh chairs in our collection in Denver. And we also have a wall here of Wiener Werkstätte designs from Austria, again with artwork by Colorado artists. And for a Colorado connection, we have a shelf of Van Briegel pottery made in Colorado Springs, Colorado, um, Art Nouveau, art pottery around the same time. The third room on this side is international style, De Stiel and Bauhaus. from about 1917 on. So we have regionalism paintings by Colorado artists along with famous furniture by Le Corbusier, Pierre Generet and Charlotte Perriand, this chaise lounge. We also have this fabulous trachea bird's feet table by Merritt Oppenheim. And then quite a few pieces connected to the German Bauhaus, both furniture and art, 
Herbert Beyer is the local connection. He was a Bauhaus instructor and student who eventually relocated to Colorado and was quite influential in the design world in Colorado. He created several paintings in our collection. This um, sculpture here on the desk. He also designed the rug and ceramic in the center of the gallery. And we have a corner of de Stiel furniture as well. The Dutch, Dutch design movement, compatriots of Mondrian. And then we re-enter our promenade and proceed across the hallway to the second half of the time travel, which is Art Deco, as you get a little preview of here. And we pair Deco with Surrealism. In the Deco Gallery, one of the star pieces is this jazz bowl, which was originally commissioned by Eleanor Roosevelt when her husband was in the governor's office of New York. It has scenes of the jazz age and was only produced for one year. So I think there were somewhere around 30 created and we're lucky to have one. All sorts of beautiful atomizers, compacts, drinking glasses, ceramic pieces here. We even have some candlesticks designed by Salvador Dali. And this amazing vase by René Lalique. The paintings on the wall are surrealist works by Colorado artists. One of our favorite um, artists, Phyllis Montrose, once joked with our founding director and curator, Hugh Grant, that artists in Colorado are more likely to make surrealist works because of being the Mile High City. We have thin air. <laughs> so we enjoy that joke. These pieces in this vignette are primarily pieces that were on the SS Normandy, the French ocean liner with stunning deco designs that was eventually sunk in New York Harbor. Luckily after most of the furnishings were removed. We also have a few pieces here, the coffee table and the console are Donald Desky deco pieces that were part of Denver's Brown Palace Hotel designs. We have some Frank Lloyd Wright works here, some, some, some more surrealist works and quite an extensive glassware collection with rubarombic cubic, cubist glass. We also have quite a number of really stunning cocktail sets here. This vignette includes a games table made of beautiful Macassar ebony by Emile Jacques Ruhlman and this six panel screen enameled or um, lacquered screen with fish by Jean Dunant. And then here we have some Clarice Cliff and Susie Cooper works from England. Now through this doorway, we jump into modern. We have vignettes from three different countries that are known for their modern works. We have, of course, the American vignette here. pan around to the Scandinavian section here and the fabulous artichoke lamp. The paintings in this room are what we call referential abstraction. They're more and more abstracted but are still of realistic subjects. And this is one of our favorite vignettes, the Italian modern Lips Sofa, Boca Sofa by Studio 65.
And the final room of our time travel experience, though not of the museum, is a continuation of modern with some really amazing bentwood furniture, pure abstraction artworks by Colorado artists, and then postmodern design as well with these uh, chairs and the pure abstraction paintings. And then over this direction, we have a nod to Christopher Dresser. We believe he might be the only person designer who really spans the full arc of our time travel. This is the Christie Sugar Bowl. Here in green, it's made of plastic, but it's so fun that it would have originally been designed in 1864 and made silver plated. Here Alessi has reproduced it as a plasticware piece but still honored Dresser's design and I think really shows how modern Dresser is in his, um, his aesthetic. It holds up to being postmodern. They've named it the Christie Sugar Bowl in homage and it's also fun to see that he designed the feet here so that they could also be handles for the sugar bowl. I think it's just such a stunning shape and, and fun to have us be able to revisit Dresser at the end of our time travel tour. Now we will continue down the promenade, which includes other vignettes. of our collection. This promenade gallery is a signature of Jim Olson's architectural style who designed our new beautiful golden building. He's a Seattle-based architect with Olson Kundig and these long colonnades with views at the end of paintings are part of his signature style and something we really enjoy about our building. Here at the end of the promenade, just before we reach the studio, which is that brick wall, we have the temporary exhibition gallery behind me that we'll get to in a moment, but here's a sculpture gallery in which we have more natural light and can show ceramic and metal, primarily sculptures, all by Colorado artists. These fun musicians of found objects by Bob Ragland. And we also have an exterior sculpture space where visitors can go outside and admire the terracotta and gold and glass tiles that make up the facade of our exterior and also this beautiful yin and yang bronze sculpture by Edgar Britton. This brick structure is Vance Kirkland's Historic Studio and Art School building and this stunning Open Suns series work by Kirkland. In 2016, the studio building was detached from our former museum location, an addition at 13th and Pearl, dug underneath and articulating wheels were attached to beams underneath the studio building that allowed it to be rolled by remote control about a mile down Capitol Hill to our new location on Bannock Street, certainly one of the most exciting days of my career.
We are so grateful to Merle Chambers Fund for funding this new building and to Merle Chambers herself for the inspiration to move the studio. She was familiar with having seen a historic structure be moved in her youth and really advocated for it. And we're so grateful. Hugh Grant, of course, would tell you, and we all agree, that Kirkland Studio is the heart of the museum experience, and it would not have been worth relocating the museum without being able to take the studio. So, just as you saw in the Kirkland Gallery at the beginning of this tour, all of the paintings in these three rooms are by Vance Kirkland. I've now entered the front room, which would have been an office or classroom during the time that it was Vance Kirkland's building. He had possession of this structure from 1932 when he opened the Kirkland School of Art until his death in 1981. We like to call this the watercolor room. These are primarily realist watercolors that he painted as the first of his five painting periods. And you can see he did fairly realistic mountain scenes, some birds like this owl. And then he got kind of tired of painting what he saw in front of him and started painting ruins and then got more and more specific to the minutia at his feet. And so he started painting deadwood formations, both real and imagined creatures and plants. And that led to his surrealist phase for which he was very well known and respected. He was carried by Nodler and Company in New York City as a surreal watercolorist. But that didn't hold his interest. So he eventually began experimenting with larger works, with oil paintings, and we'll move on to those. I do want to mention quickly before I move on that um, the furniture in this gallery, much of it was in Vance Kirkland's collection during his lifetime, although Hugh Grant, with support from Merle Chambers, is responsible for collecting nearly everything you've seen in the museum after Vance Kirkland's passing and for coming up with the idea to have a museum at all that did not come from Vance Kirkland himself. But Hugh did inherit Vance Kirkland's estate, which included some of his own personal collection. He did have some especially modern and deco things, and he collected tableware on his travels around the world, including some of these pieces that we display in this case here. He also owned and enjoyed sitting in this machine age rocking chair. We have several photos of him in that chair. So here is an example of his third period, Timberline Abstractions from Nature. He got more and more hard edged, sometimes using watercolor or gouache as you see here, but then also doing the same sorts of styles in oil paint. This would have been the entrance the entire time it was an art school. This building was first constructed in 1911 to be Henry Reed's Student School of Art and then became the Kirkland School of Art in 1932. Um, after 1946, Kirkland went back to the University of Denver where he ran their art school. And so from that time on, it was only his studio space. So from these hard edge abstractions, he invented a pretty miraculous and fairly unique uh, painting style combining oil paint with water. And that allowed him to do abstract expressionist paintings like this one. Here are some photographs of Vance. So here, I'm going to show you some photographs. 
of Kirkland's process. So Kirkland would paint an underlayer of a painting flat on the surface you'll see in the next room, his studio. He would then pour out oil paint and water combinations. We know that oil and water don't mix, but he used baby food jars to combine them as much as possible. Then he would flick around the paint with spoons, encouraging it in different directions until he liked the quality of surface that he received and he would put down a dry cloth or paper towel and pull off the water leaving the diluted oil paint with popped bubbles to dry and that would have been the final layer of a painting in his abstract expressionist fourth period like this one here and you can see if we zoom in there's lots of popped bubbles, which is how you know he used that technique. So for paintings like this one, that would have been the final layer. He did the oil and water technique for this white top layer, a little bit of pink and black there on top of the base that would have already dried. And then his final and best known painting period is the dot paintings which he did at the end of his career, and he would have applied dots very meticulous, meticulously, usually on top of the oil paint and water, although this is a transitional period here where you can see um, some sections don't have dots on top covering it. And there are lots of sub-series within each of these periods. I know this is a day focused on decorative art, so thank you for letting me tell you what I know and love about Vance Kirkland, our namesake. You can see here his painting table and the straps. He would occasionally hang face down on the straps, suspending himself above a painting. And that allowed him to be right over the part that he was working on. He was uh, fairly short. He was about five, two and a half, but also needing to work flat. It's very difficult to reach across a table, especially for these larger works. Uh, for so much of the day. So he would sometimes use straps. And he was also syn synesthetic, which is the combination of more than one sense with another. And so he would see colors when he listened to music. And he especially liked music with a lot of dissonance in it. So he would listen to Bartok and Shostakovich and write down color combinations. This on the left is a wonderful series called the Open Suns Paintings. And then you see two portraits also by Vance Kirkland on the right, including his only former formal self-portrait, which is on the bottom. And we do show quite a few of his tools here, the dowels that he used to very meticulously place dots on his paintings, some of his paints. Baby food jars were his favorite medium for mixing and some of his other tools. Behind me, we do have a video room where we allow visitors to watch educational videos, primarily of the studio move. And then the little outhouse there. Then we end in our ceramics corridor, which has a history of Colorado ceramics. And now we will head back to our temporary gallery so that you can explore our temporary exhibition. This is our Truth, Beauty and Power, Christopher Dresser in the Aesthetic Movement temporary exhibition, which is on view in Denver through January 2nd. We have here 
Mr. Dresser, our buddy. And as I explained before, we're using his work to explore four themes, all from the permanent collection of Kirkland Museum, assembled by our founding director and curator, Hugh Grant. And here is the stunning five-legged chair, which we will speak to further this afternoon. Check your program for the time when we will do a deeper dive into the attribution of this chair to Christopher Dresser. Normally, our entire collection and temporary exhibitions have more of a salon style display, but here we've focused on the decorative art collection to do a deeper dive, and we're gonna hear more about a couple of pieces from my co-curator, Becca Goodrum. Hi everyone, I'm Becca. It's impossible to walk into this exhibit and not stop in front of this beautiful display cabinet designed by Christopher Dresser. The door panels on this cabinet use a technique called cloisonne. Cloisonne is created by attaching fine wires to a metal surface that creates an, a, a decorative element or shape that is then filled with enamel and fired and polished. Japanese artisans had perfected this technique in the 19th century, and this cabinet further illustrates Dresser's admiration for Japanese ornamentation. Another piece in the Japanism section by Dresser is this Indiana jug. We included this in the Japanism section because we wanted to explain that Dresser's interests were not exclusive to Japan. Designs like this Indiana jug were inspired by Indian textiles Dresser saw at the India Museum at Whitehall in London. The pattern on this vessel is a variation on traditional Indian tree of life motifs. We'll walk slowly over to the art botany section. Dresser was a trained botanist receiving an, honor, an honorary doctorate in this field. In this section, we show at the Dresser Hamden plate, which has restrained ornamentation that emphasizes and respects the plate shape. And then we'll walk over to the Animalia section, where I want to talk a little bit about these comparison boards that we've put in each section of this exhibit. So throughout the exhibits that Maya took you through earlier of our permanent galleries where you time traveled with her, we really love that this museum allows you to compare and contrast design styles and see where we come from and where we're going. That's not possible in this exhibit because we don't have any early 19th century decorative art in, in this collection. So we wanted people to truly understand how much changed during the aesthetic era. So we wanted to give you a little bit of visual information to see what was happening in the early 19th century versus what happened during the aesthetic movement. So this is the Animalia comparison wall board, and here you see an early 19th century platter. You'll see cows, a landscape, a large buildings, a whole like cityscape kind of in the background. It's a whole pastoral scene. And then you'll also see this seemingly random floral border. There's nothing left undecorated, it's very ornate. Um, formal and realistic. And then you see in the later 19th century this aesthetic William de Morgan plate that shows more playful simplistic design. The bird is floating with no background, no landscape background, and the border without being random pulls your eye inward towards the bird, so the bird is your focus. During the aesthetic era designers embraced empty space and more purposeful design which is evidenced in all of the pieces that you see in our Animalia case here. And then we will slowly walk over to the color section. This exhibit is separated into four themes, as we discussed earlier. I am standing now in front of the color theme. 
Dresser talks a lot about his love of clay as a material. Clay can take on any amount of color and be formed into almost any shape that you can imagine, which Dresser loves. Another idea he mentions that I just love is that clay is an inexpensive material, almost worthless in its original state. But when formed and decorated by an artist, it can transmute into gold. People pay good money for certain vessels if they are beautiful. Therefore, artists can turn mud or common elements into something very valuable. All the objects in this case and many others in the exhibition were part of a generous gift from Rosemary Hogg Blatter and Martin Filler. This generous gift was the impetus for this entire exhibit and we could not be more grateful to them. Martin Filler will be joining us for the Q&A portion later today. We hope that museum visitors leave the exhibit with a better understanding of the design reform movement and the important role that Christopher Dresser played.